Welcome everyone to the first episode of the Spring 2023 edition of our vlog series. I am Alessandro Tacconelli, PhD candidate of the Center for Law and Economics here at ETH Zurich. Every professional working in asset pricing and portfolio management sector has heard of the famous Fama French model. Originating in the 90s, the model was developed to ameliorate previously used methods of evaluation and rapidly became the golden rule for financial evaluations. Academics worldwide started to use the model, advocating for its use even in the legal sector. But was this really a good idea? As of now, can we really be so sure that the model actually improved previously used methods of evaluations? To try to find an answer to these questions, I'm very happy to have here with me today Adriana Robertson, Donald and Pritzker Professor of Business Law at the University of Chicago Law School. Adriana's research interests lie at the intersection of law and finance, including capital markets regulation, securities law, corporate finance and business law. Today we will be discussing uh, her recent paper, Noisy Factors. Welcome, Adriana. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Before we dive into the discussion of the paper, why don't you give us a brief overview of its background and main content? Sure, yeah. So, um, as you said, the, the Fama French factors are sort of standard used uh, throughout finance. And what we found in Noisy Factors, which is the companion paper to Noisy Factors in Law, uh, we found that there are these substantial retroactive changes to the data. So what I mean by that, just to be clear, is that if you download the data today and you look at the return from one of the factors from, say, January of 1989, and you compare it to a version that you've got on your computer that you downloaded a year ago, right, and you look at the return from January 1989, those two numbers will be different. Right? So it's not that you know, the most recent version changes. Of course, the data gets updated. But it also gets changed in the past. And so the way we discovered this was actually because we were working on a completely different project and we wanted to you know, add some additional variables so we downloaded the data again and before we changed anything in our model uh, we just reran it and all of the numbers changed and we were sitting there tearing our hair out trying to figure out like we didn't change the code we didn't change the sample period we didn't change anything why are the numbers changing and then eventually it's like the last thing we thought of we just opened the data in two different excel sheets and lo and behold it turned out that the numbers were different uh, and so from there, it was just like a, a thread on an old sweater. We just kind of kept pulling on it and pulling on it and pulling on it, and it just kept unraveling. Uh, so we went and got a whole bunch of older vintages, and we just compared them to each other. And so in the original paper, my two co-authors, uh, Mike Samutin and Pat Eakey, they're sort of pure finance guys. I'm a law and finance person. Uh, so they were quite reasonably focused on the pure finance applications, and so that's what we did at first. We looked at sort of... Um, alphas and betas, we looked at mutual funds, we looked at performance evaluation, all sorts of very standard things. Um, and the whole time we were doing this, I just kept saying all excitedly, uh, you know how this really matters for law and it, it appears in all these places and you know, we really need to talk about this. And of course the reaction was, that's great, uh, we'll get to that, but for now let's just focus on this paper. Um, and so that's what we did. And then we moved on to noisy factors in law and that's the, the paper that uh, you had for today. Um, very interesting, Adriana. Thank you. So, in your paper, talking about the law implications, uh, in your paper, uh, when discussing about the use of Fama French model in securities litigation, you admit that in many relevant settings, those noisy factors will not be so noisy to be dispositive for liability claims. But if this is the case, then should we really worry about the use of Fama French model? I mean, in practice, what are the substantial legal implications of your findings? Yeah, so the, the real cynic in me says, look, you know, the dueling experts, the, in this case, if it's securities class action, the plaintiff's expert, um, they're going to find some way, they're going to p-hack their way to get the answer that they're looking for. And so, 
if you know you happen to get a different version of the factors that happen to give you less uh, of a large drop or, or less statistical significance, you know, you'll tweak the sample period, you'll do something uh, so that you can get the answer that you're looking for. So maybe you say, well, given all of that, it doesn't really, it's not necessarily going to be dispositive. Um, and that, that's clearly true. Although I still think that the noisy factors would matter. So to the extent that it does affect magnitudes, um, these things, securities class actions, they always settle. 99% right? of the time um, you settle and the magnitude that you find will affect the settlement value right, of that claim. And so given that 99% of them settle, affecting the settlement value actually does matter for the ultimate outcome uh, of such a claim. Right? And then, of course, there's a bunch of other settings where the noisy factors could matter a lot, uh, legal settings. And so, for example, the one that's the most troubling to me is actually uh, the analysis of investment products. Right? So we've got all these fiduciaries who have a legal obligation. They have legal, legally enforceable duties of care and loyalty right, to their clients. Uh, and their job is to evaluate investment products and make recommendations. And the standard advice that we have been giving these fiduciaries for decades is use a factor model. That way you can get a risk-adjusted analysis uh, of the performance. And if you open a standard textbook, it'll tell you, download you know, the data from French's website, and you know, maybe you're going to supplement the three-factor model with momentum or something else, but you're going to start with that standard data. And so, if you do that, it turns out that your answer could depend upon when you downloaded the data. And we show in Noisy Factors in Law, right, with just a, a cute little example of the five largest mutual funds um, at a particular year, that depending on when you downloaded the data, you can get very different results. And so what is this diligent, honest, careful, loyal fiduciary supposed to do? How is she supposed to know whether a fund's performance is good or bad when you know, the advice we've been giving her for decades leads to these weird, indeterminate solutions. Uh, that one really is quite troubling to me. Um, and then, of course, you know, we talk about a few others in the paper. Valuation, and we use valuation in lots of different places in law. Um, and, and then more generally, I think, it kind of raises questions about the reliance on experts and expert analysis and you know, burying all sorts of judgment calls in those expert analyses. Thank you very much. So moving from the legal sector to academic research more in general, your recollection of the drawbacks of the Fama French model reminded me somehow of this uh, huge replication crisis that social sciences are still experiencing. Now, in the paper, you do discuss about how the date on which uh, Fama French data uh, are downloaded, keeping everything else constant, so as you said, including the sample periods, could actually vary the resulting p-values of the analysis. Would you then conclude that this is worrying in terms of replicability and robustness of financial research? Absolutely. And, and by the way, um, I actually think that it's you know, a problem as a researcher because uh, this data, you know, it's so standard. And imagine now putting yourself in the position of a, a researcher who does an analysis uh, totally, you know, honest, totally careful. Um, you describe exactly what you did, and maybe you even share your code, but you don't share the raw data from you know, the factor data, because why would you do that? Anybody can just download it. And then somebody else comes along five years later and wants to replicate your result, and they can't. I mean, that's actually really <laughs> disturbing to me as a researcher that somebody wouldn't be able to do that, and I wouldn't be able to tell them why. And so all of a sudden, you know, you start, you could start doubting yourself, you could start wondering what's going on. And so even just as a, a self-protective measure for researchers, I think it's, it's troubling and, and frankly a little bit scary uh, that you wouldn't be able to replicate your own results even though you didn't change anything. Um, and then, you know, I think it also gets to this question of data and code sharing because part of the reason why people didn't fully appreciate uh, the extent of these changes. Uh, you know, it's sort of interesting, in the course of presenting this paper and, and circulating it, we've had quite a number of people come to us and mention, like, oh, you know, I, I kind of had noticed this before. You know, I went and uh, updated my job market paper three years after I uh, originally wrote it, and I went and re-downloaded the data, and I noticed that there were all these changes. Uh, so that was really fun and, and also, frankly, quite comforting that uh, 
other people had noticed this because given how ubiquitous the data are, if, if nobody had ever noticed this before, and given how long the publication process is in finance, would have wondered if we were maybe hallucinating or something. And it turned out we weren't. Uh, other people had noticed the changes. They just you know, maybe weren't uh, stupid or obsessive enough to you know, dig into it to try to figure out what was going on. Uh, but in any event, the fact that the code wasn't shared publicly is, I think, the reason why this wasn't more transparent from the get-go. And just to be very clear, I think you know, this data has been shared since the 90s, and the norms, in part because of this replication crisis, the norms around sharing data and sharing code have really evolved a lot in the last 30 years. And so you know, I think maybe it was some informal grandfathering, maybe, of this data that you know, people didn't even really think about it. And you know, maybe this is a, a good opportunity for us to rethink that and to be uh, even more committed to the ideas of transparency and code and, and data sharing going forward. Yeah. So we can say that in a way your contribution provides an example of how expert analysis can go wrong, especially when transposed into the legal sector. Now, I believe that the pandemic has been characterized by an animated debate about trust in science and more specifically trust in experts' opinions. I think it's also interesting to look back at that debate based on what we are discussing here today together. But then, uh, what's the solution? I mean, starting from the Fama French model, but then expanding to other instances as well, if we cannot trust experts, then what should we trust? Yeah, it's a little bit discouraging. And, and it's also kind of a statement against interest for me to cast doubt on experts. Uh, given that I kind of like am one, I guess we both are. So it's, it's a weird position to be in. Uh, and I don't think that the conclusion from, uh, that's certainly not the conclusion I draw, is not uh, we should never trust experts, you know, we should just throw darts at the wall and that's how we should decide things because after all, every opinion is just as good as every other opinion. I, mean, I think that would be taking it a little bit too far. Uh, but I do think that uh, sort of informally, I have this idea what, that I call the, the law of conservation of judgment which is that there's always judgment in every analysis of every question. Uh, and sometimes I think what we can do when we start to get too technical or just more technical is, you know, we make it seem like, oh, this is objective, uh, this is scientific, there's no judgment here, um, when really what's going on is you're kind of shoving the judgment into a corner where it's not as obvious. So going back to a legal setting, take take a securities class action, for example, the most obvious judgment would be you come to the materiality question and you just, a judge just decides. Right? And a judge just gives reasons in her decision of why she thinks you know, this was or was not material. And that's the most obvious transparent form of judgment. You could do an event study where you say, oh, no, no, uh, I don't want the judge to, to just use her judgment. I'm going to do an analysis where I'm going to run a factor model and I'm going to see if the market you know, interpreted this as, as a material. And that's scientific and that's objective and then we don't need judgment. But of course that's not true because there's a million judgment calls that go into doing your analysis. It's just that the judgment is, is buried. It's, it's sort of somewhere just below the surface. And then you can get even more extreme. You could do a total black box model where you say, no, 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 no judgment at all here. Uh, I just let the computer do it. But of course, we know that that's not really true. There's a million judgment calls that go into that, but now they're buried really, really far down and it's really hard to see them. And so like, I don't know what the right answer is. I think that probably just you know, letting somebody make something up is probably not optimal. It's not predictable and, and there's problems with that. Uh, but we also can't close our eyes and pretend that there's no judgment in anything. And so my guess is I'm not a, an epidemiologist, I'm not a you know, medical professional, but my guess is that it's probably kind of similar. There's a lot of judgment calls that go into all sorts of decisions. And I don't, we can't avoid that. Uh, but maybe what we can try to do is be more upfront about the fact that, of course, there are judgment calls and, of course, people can disagree about things. Um, and then, you know, we just have to do the best we can, given the uncertainty. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us today. Uh, to conclude, what are the lessons that you think policymakers can learn from your own findings? Well, I think, you know, the, the biggest one, it's sort of like back to basics. Um, 
transparency around how judgment is being exercised. Um, again, I don't think we want to throw away expertise, uh, but I do think that we should try to be a little bit more clear about how we're using our expertise. Uh, so code sharing, um, thinking really carefully about where our assumptions are coming from and what decisions were made in the background. So, you know, this, the way I kind of think about the factor data is it's an intermediate, it's not totally raw data, but it's also not a final data product. It's, a, it's an intermediate input. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know, decisions go into making that. Um, and I think it's fine to rely on it, but I think uh, it's, it can be problematic if we forget that that, that is what we're doing. Um, so that's sort of like pretty unsatisfying maybe. I don't have like a silver bullet answer. I think part of the reason I don't have a silver bullet answer is, you know, I think two years ago if you had asked 10 financial economists to give you the 10 most pressing issues in empirical finance, nobody would have listed this. Like, this was not on anybody's radar as a problem. And so, and yet, I think, you know, you show it to people and like, well, it's like kind of a problem. Um, which means that I have no idea how to predict what the next problem is going to be. So you know, I think we just have to be careful and open and, and transparent and also um, willing to admit when we find things that weren't quite as we, as we expected. Thank you again, Adriana, for being with us here today. We look forward to hearing about your future research. Allow me to conclude with the very last two sentences of your paper, which I deem summarize well uh, what LOIC and economics researchers aim for. Science will continue to advance and law will benefit. And to our blog viewers, we hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did and see you next time.